Father, I want to commit this time, even as I share your word. Lord, this is the word that you deposited in my spirit, man, as we want to close the year well. So, Father, we pray that this word will be a reminder to every one of us to live our life well for your glory and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So I commit myself to you now, and you help me communicate your word accurately. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen. I'm going to share with you a message today that I've been wanting to share for some time, but somehow or other, uh, I could not do that because so many issues crop up, whether it be national or global, or whether it whatever it is, and I had to address all these other issues. But today, I just felt in my spirit, I need to offload this so that we end the year well, and then I feel very, very released after the third service. It is called the folly of greed. The folly of greed. My purpose of sharing this message is to help us refocus our mind, our heart, and our eyes upon the fundamental reason of why we live. Why do we live? Why is it that God has put us where we are, what we have, for what? Uh, to reorientate our minds, our hearts, and our focus back again to God. So you turn with me to Luke chapter 12. It's a parable very seldom preached and least understood. That Jesus spoke and shared off the cuff. It was not planned. It took Jesus himself by surprise. But as we know that the heart of the Lord is the heart of the Father. So even though it was not a planned teaching, out it comes. Very profound. And if we grasp it, it will change our entire trajectory in our life. So in Luke chapter 12, verse 13, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then Jesus said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told them, this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones, nothing wrong with that because it makes good business sense, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, and then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And verse 21, Jesus said, This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself Note, it's things for himself, but it's not rich towards God. Actually, Jesus didn't stop there, but I will stop there because from 20, verse 22 onwards, Jesus continued his teaching, and then he said to the disciples, and he went on just to summarize, to talk about the, what, the lilies of the field and the sparrows, how God also cares for them. And then he ends thereabouts in verse 31 seek this kingdom seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well which is better 
stated in the Matthew version, which we all read in Matthew 6.33. We all know the Matthew version. Why don't we read this together? Shall we do that? Are you ready? What does Jesus say? One, two, three. The kingdom of God and all these things. One more time. Let's read it together. Shall we do that? One, two, three. And all these things will be added unto you. And it goes on. And end this teaching in verse 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's read Luke 12, 34. Are you ready? One, two, three. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you combine verse 21 and verse 34, which are two key verses in the teaching of the Lord, it tells me that clearly the whole issue of greed is a heart issue. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It is really not much whether you are rich or not so rich. Why? Because the poor also can be greedy, man. So it's not only the fact that you have plenty, that you're greedy or not so. It's nothing to do with how much you have, but rather it's a fundamental issue of your heart. In other words, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Very interestingly, Jesus zero in on the fundamental fault line and the flaw that belies a very innocent statement that the man gave to Jesus. So if you look actually at the passage in verse 13, it was a very sudden encounter. Jesus was not talking about this. He was teaching actually on the Holy Spirit. So if you look at the preceding verses, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit, walking among the crowd, and suddenly a man turned to the Lord and said, Master or teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It was a demand. It was not even a question. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It was a demand. And the Lord zeroed in that underneath that statement is a symptom of something worse, something greater. So he turned to them and he replied to them. Who is them? The two brothers. Why? Because clearly, both of them had greed. He didn't reply to him. He replied to them. So it was not whether, let me solve the problem for you, uh, because it will never be solved as long as there is greed, you see. And actually, this is exactly what happens to a lot of family feuds. Not only family feuds, uh, a lot of feuds in general. Underlying a lot of feuds, they are just symptomatic of something more sinister. And in this case, it was greed. And so now Jesus then begins to teach them what greed is all about. Very interestingly, this is the only parable I know. You can check me out, you can point out to me if I'm wrong where God himself was an active participator. How do I know? Verse 20. In the parable, uh, God said to him, no, wait, God is involved. But you say God is involved in all parables are true. But usually in all the other parables, God was a passive participator. For example, um, he is represented as the owner of the vineyard the master of the house. So we, ins we, 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 we 
conjecture that that person must be God. Or uh, the Pharisee pray to God. So God is passive. But it's the only parable in which God decides, hey, I want to be an active participator because in the parable, God said. So what did God say? Of all the parables that I know, God chose to be involved directly in this parable. And God said, you fool. So bear take heart what God said. Huh? Jesus did not make a legal judgment. What makes me, Jesus says, a judge or an arbiter? But he made a moral one. He made a moral judgment because both of them were greedy and it was a moral heart issue of greed. But what is greed? It's the word pleonexia, which means the lust. Now, the Greek language is richer than the English one. English language is more... Uh, 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 was confined or, or fine, uh, limited. Whereas the Greek and the Chinese language is more rich, you know. So when we talk about greed, it's actually the lust to have more than one's fair share. It's a lust. It's a grasping for more that will never be satisfied. In other words, you will never be satisfied. Now, it's, most of us don't, don't start with greed. Most of us don't start with that. It's nothing wrong with putting down the barns and, 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 and prospering in your business. I am not anti-rich. A rich businessman once told me in this church, I am anti-rich. I am not anti-rich. Okay, I'm not. When I say this, I don't say it with a tongue in my cheek, what I call, uh, uh, um, how to say tongue in my cheek, with a bone to pick, like, in other words. Huh? In other words, because personally, I'm not poor. I'm not as rich as a lot of you, but I'm not poor. So I'm not jealous of you. I'm not, I'm not, okay? But so hear me well. It is not how much you have, but it's a grasping. It's a lust. It's an insatiable desire to have more and more and more, a wanting more than what you already have enough. Charles Swindle describes a person who is greedy this way. He says, picture a shipwrecked man floating on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Under the noonday sun, day after day, this man is very, very thirsty. So he comes to a point in time in which this intense desire to drink overcomes him, overpowers him, and he begins to drink the sea water. But as he began to drink the salt water, what it does is it makes him more thirsty. And the more thirsty he becomes, the more salt water he drinks. And the more salt water he drinks, the more thirsty he becomes until he becomes dehydrated and he dies. It's a paradox. It's a desire that you will never be satisfied. It's a heart condition. It's a heart condition. So Jesus says, a man's life, in verse 15, does not consist of the abundance of his possession. But greed tells us the opposite, you see. And the opposite is this. A man's life does consist of of the abundance of his possession. And so, he go for it. It was Malcolm Forbes, the son of B.C. Forbes, who founded the Forbes magazine, who said this, the one who dies with the most toys wins. And we know that people like Forbes, 
they were American successful American entrepreneurs. They were the promoters of an extravagant lifestyle. Parties, yachts, aeroplanes, art. He has since died. Has he won? Very interestingly, if you look at this passage, the Lord tells us three key principles on how we view what we have. It is not the amount. It is how you see what you have. Understand? So the first thing I note of a person that is consumed by greed. How do I know that? Is number one. He doesn't give God the honor. Enough. A person consumed by greed do not give God the credit and the glory due to Him enough. I, lost, I, I should have put the word enough. Why? Because most of us, if not all of us, do to some extent give God glory. But the problem with us is that God becomes secondary and is a footnote. 90% of our time, we live as if God does not exist. And we do not honor Him and give Him the glory enough. How do I know? Look at this man. Remember, Jesus is now teaching. He said, look at this man. The ground of a certain man, verse 16, produced a good crop. So he was very successful. He was a farmer whose crops, in one version says, plentiful. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being successful. Nothing wrong. I repeat it again and again. But look at what he says. Look at the attitude of his heart. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and then I will sort up my grain, my goods. Say to myself, key is this, where is God? You know, I meet up with Edmund, uh, my friend, Philip, on and off. And every time we meet together, uh, these are fellow pastors. And one of the things we share when we share our journey, and we inevitably ask ourselves, where is God in all of this? Where is God in your journey, Wing Chi? Edmund, where is God? In all your travels, Philip, where is God? Hey, it's a good reminder, right? Where is God? You see a footnote? You see priority? Or we live as if there is no God. We don't give God enough of honor and glory and gratitude. See, this man thought that it was him. This man thought that I is my cleverness. It's the way I do this. I will do this. I have nothing wrong. It makes good business sense. But there is no God in whatever he says. Where is God? That's the point that Jesus is trying to tell the people. Where is God in all of this? We do not give God enough gratitude and thank him enough. You know, my wife tells me this. Um, he says, no, Wing Chi, darling, you know, one thing I notice about you, I say, what is it? He says, uh, I notice that you are actually a very grateful person. I thought about it. I agree. <laughs> so, I, so I told her, why, why, why do you say that? Why do you say that I'm grateful? You see, I notice, for example, that you thank God for every small mercies. It's true, huh? Yeah. 
Then he gave me some examples. You know, the other day you would do this and you thank God. You know, I'm I'm healed now of my back and I thank God. You do this and I thank God. Everything also you thank God, man. Ah. So I also learned. Oh, she said. So, so I agree. <laughs> you know, learn to thank God for small, small things. Don't only big things. Understand. Thank God. When you and I have a grateful heart, really, I tell you, it lifts your eyes above the mundane. And believe me, you see God every day. Let's give God a clap offering. Come on, even a clap. Let's give God a good clap offering. Amen. So how do I know that I'm not consumed by greed? I know when I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for small mercies. I don't take God for granted, like in other words, you know what I'm saying? I don't take God for granted, but I see Him in everything that I do, everything that I have. So, a person consumed by greed, do not give God enough credit, honor, and thanksgiving, which we should. How do I know that I'm consumed by greed? Number two, this is very interesting. A person that's consumed by greed. Lacks spiritual discernment because he's so taken up by the mundane and the physical, and only bothered about himself and getting bigger, 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 expanding. Nothing wrong with that, but when it totally consumes you, God is pushed out of the equation of your life, and slowly your spiritual. Human is dull. In other words, you begin to weigh things and critical decisions of your life purely from a physical, mundane perspective. It is exactly what is here. So, what has happened here? You see, verse nineteen. I'll say to myself, the man says, "You have plenty to good things laid up for many years now. Praise God for that." Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Nothing wrong with that. But when God said to him in verse twenty, "You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself?" Now, what is a fool? The word fool is the word Ephron, because there are many, many words for fool. One is that one is raka, all right. But a word here is the word Ephron. Or, and as I said, the English language is not so rich as the Greek language. The fool is a fooler, huh? but for in the Greek language, there are many kinds of fools. This fool, the Ephron, is someone who lacks spiritual discernment. In other words, he doesn't see things from a spiritual perspective. He is dull to it. He's blind, blindsided. He's blind to it. He doesn't see God there, you see. So that's why he's called Ephron, you fool. Psalm fourteen, verse one, the Bible amplifies it when he says, "The fool has said in his heart, there is no God." Ephron, Ephron. So it's nothing to do with the intellectual capacity. You you might be straight A's, Cambridge double first. It's not that. It's nothing to do with your mental capacity or your intellectual uh, 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 capacity. Nothing to do with the fact how clever you are, how smart you are. But just because you lack spiritual discernment, you are a fool. And who said this? God said this. You know. Wow, I told you the first time. Ah,、uh, God featured in any parable in the active tense. God chose to say, "You fool." You lack spiritual discernment, Ephron. So this man is a fool because he did not recognize that his material blessings came from God. He did not recognize that he thought it was himself. This man is a fool because he did not recognize any responsibility to God for his material blessings. He thought that it is his. He thought that that's how I view things. I view life, and God said, "You fool." Very interestingly, 
in verse 20, God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. So what is so spiritual that God wants us to have? What kind of perspective? The word demanded, I checked it out, is a very, very unusual word again. It's a word epitio. Again, the English language is very, very uh, not so rich. The Greek language is richer. Actually, it means to demand back. I require back from you. So God is saying to this rich man, this night I take your life back, meaning that it doesn't belong to you. You know, you all have astro on demand, right? Astro on demand, right? This is life on demand, no? You know why? Because life is a loan that must be repaid to God upon demand. It's not yours. Sorry, la. You know why? None of us know when God takes it back. Because God said to this man, tonight, tonight. Listen to me very carefully. It's true. None of us know. It is actually on loan. How many years? I don't know. In other words, everything that God gives to us is on loan. That's why when we meet him, we talk about accountability. Ma. Accounting. Ma. Accountant. Ma. Account. Ma. So what is accountability? It's on loan. It's a stewardship. And it makes sense, you see, when we understand how life is all about, what we have, what we do, you see, I told you there are five things that, will be, that we will be held accountable to. I told you many times. Let me repeat it. All start with T. Your time, your talents, your treasure, your torso, your teman teman. I repeat, your time is on loan. None of us know how long, right? Your talent, on loan. Your treasure, on loan. Your torso, your body, lah, on loan. Your teman, teman, the company you keep, on loan. So use your influence for God. Use your network for God because it's on loan. So life, it's not ours to own, but ours on loan. So man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. It's all on loan. And one day, we will be held accountable. Um, how many of you have heard of this Russian author called Leo Tolstoy? Name me one book that he's written. War and Peace, absolutely. Anna Karolina and so on. Okay, never mind. He, he writes uh, a very famous Russian author that wrote in the late 80s, 1800s, and then in the early 1900s. He also writes short stories. He also writes short stories, and one of his short stories is entitled, How Much Land Does a Man Need? And he tells a story of this farmer by the name of Poham. In Russian, I don't know what it means, Poham. And he writes a story of this successful peasant in the rural Russia who's very successful. He owns acreage and acreage of farmland. And, uh, but he was very greedy, you see. This guy was very greedy and he wants more and 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 more until one day he met a, a, a person. And this person clearly was someone who is supernatural, don't know where, whoever he is. And he offered Poham 1,000 rubles to buy so that he can buy whatever land that he wants 
as long as he walks on that land. So the more he walks, the further he walks, the more land he gets for a thousand rubles, right? Wow, why not? Who don't want? I, I also want, man. One condition. He got to do it in 24 hours. And at the end of 24 hours, he must always come back to your starting point. So next morning, this farmer woke up early in the morning, waiting for the sunrise. The moment the sun rose, he began to walk. Initially, it was a very slow walk because it's early morning walk. And then he suddenly realized, hey, the more I walk, the more I get, right? Then he started to run. He started running, and running, and running, and run because, wow, the more he runs, the more land he gets, a thousand rubles, you know. So he ran and ran and ran and ran. And then until, until uh, late afternoon, he decided that he was very far away from the starting point. So he began to turn back. Why? Because he must be back in the starting point by sundown. Ma. So he ran back. He ran back. But then the clock is coming down. The sun was setting. So he ran and ran and ran until he saw the starting point just within reach. And the sun was coming down by seconds. So he ran and ran and ran. Oh, ran and, and he crossed the finish line just by two seconds. He made it. But he collapsed and he died. According to Leo Tolstoy, and they buried him with only six feet by three feet of land. So how much land do you need? Interesting story, oh. Very interesting story. God demanded his life back. You know, Pastor Li Chu and I have already bought our burial ground. I just want to be buried next to my best friend. That's all. A fool like spiritual discernment. How many of you have heard of this guy called Jim Elliot? Show me a hand in the balcony. Yeah. You know, he was a missionary to the Auka Indians in Ecuador. In 1958, he was killed together with four other fellow missionaries. And uh, out of that tragedy, um, the whole evangelical circle was rocked and, and shocked by his sudden death. The tragedy of it, killed by poison arrows to, by the very people that he wanted to evangelize. But out of that, his wife Elizabeth Elliot and his daughter Valerie Elliot went back again after the grieving period to continue what their loved one had, had been hijacked and, and, and shortchanged so tragically. And within many years, actually it was many years of hard work, now today, a lot of the Auka Indians have now become Christians, you see. But out of that tragedy also, in 1958, a lot of missionaries were sent out into the world. Somehow, people were so encouraged by this sacrifice that there was a surge of missionary movement as a result of this tragedy, and people gave their lives to serve God full-time as a missionary. John 12. A seed falls to the ground, abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much, what? Fruit. Jim Elliot wrote this famous statement. We all know this. He says, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now, it's a mouthful. So you unpackage it. It took me some time to unpackage it. Let me unpackage it together. He is no fool. Who is this person? Who gives up what he cannot keep. You can't keep it. So you give it lah in order to gain what he cannot lose. Understand? This guy is not a fool. But if you don't give up what you cannot keep, and then you keep what you actually don't gain, you're a fool. 
So he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Listen to me very carefully, friend. I don't know why the Lord asked me to share it. I wanted to share it for a long, long time. No? But of course, there are no issues now in the government, no issues now in the nation. So share, share this. No? Nothing fire me, you see. <laughs> so, okay, it's time to share. Interestingly, Jesus says, a person consumed by greed actually don't give him enough glory and honour commensurate with the blessings he gets. Number two, a person who is consumed by greed actually takes God for granted and does not have the spiritual discernment. Third thing, a man or a woman consumed by greed is not rich towards God. That's what he said in verse 21. Jesus says this is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. A very interesting phrase. So Jesus wants all of us to be rich towards him as well as rich. There's nothing wrong with being rich. I don't preach a prosperity gospel and you know that, right? There's nothing wrong with doing well, nothing wrong with whatever you have. But the question that the Lord ultimately asks us is this. Are you rich towards God? God. Now, what is rich towards God? Well, this is my definition. My definition of a person who is rich towards God are those who truly loves God. And when you say you love God, so you will gladly, not grudgingly, invest in God's kingdom so that His kingdom expands, so that lives are, are rich for Jesus Christ and also invest in the lives of his people to build them up. So in other words, your whole persona, your whole perspective in life is God, God, God. And it translates your viewpoint, your perspective from here to here. You are rich towards God. Now, are there biblical examples? Plenty. It took me only 10 seconds to write all these things down. Maybe 20 seconds. Lah. I just jot down a few names. Priscilla and Aquila. Who are they? X. Romans. They were fellow tent makers with Paul. What did they do? They opened their house. They opened their house for a house church. And everywhere Paul went, he, they, 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 they helped Paul. I don't know whether they are rich. They're probably middle class. Lah. But they are very rich towards God, right? Lydia, the successful businesswoman in Acts 16 that was saved by the river. He, she was a very successful businesswoman of purple cloth. You know how many successful businesswomen are here? I don't know. Don't stand up. Don't raise your hands. You know how many successful businesswomen are here? You're good. You've done well like Lydia. But what did Lydia do? Lydia, as when he was, she was saved, gave his heart 100% for work and she was one of the co-founders of the Philippian church. How many Lydias are here? The home of Mary, Martha and Lazarus. All it needs is a room and a bed for Jesus. It doesn't need gold-plated taps. Just a bed. Are they rich towards God? Very rich. Dokas, who's Dokas? X9. I think she's a widow herself. But she was the one that helped the widows and the poor, knitting clothes for them and helping them in whatever she can. And when she died, all the widows came to Peter and said, Peter, oh, I'm so sorry, Dokas passed away. What to do? Huh? Peter looked at them and said, okay, let me help you and raise Dokas from the, from the dead so that she can continue doing what she can do to bless God's people. Are you missed? I don't know. 
But you say, Pastor, all this is not rich. Lah. So I listed down three people who are. Hey, hey, Peter quite rich, right? No? Because he owns a, feeding, a, a, a fishing fleet, right? Because at the, after he denied Jesus, he went back to fishing boats. So he actually owned a fishing fleet. Well, no, it's not a fishing boat by, 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 by line. One, uh, okay? So he is actually quite wealthy. One. And, and you say, oh, you're not wealthy. No. What about Daniel? Hey, the prime minister. No. How many prime ministers are here? <laughs> hey, what about Joseph? Influential, rich. But all of them also rich towards God. Do you think so? And of course, Dr. Liu. Successful doctor and yet followed Paul. So much so that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, this, which says that Demas loved the world and has deserted me, Paul says. And the next verse, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. He's stuck with it. Stickability. To take to thin, he never deserted me. Demas agape the world and deserted me. Only Luke is with me. A doctor gave his life for God. All these people, very rich to us, God. Let me give you two examples that we all know, or to some extent, Malaysian or something like that. First one, you, you remember uh, Pastor Lee Chu shared with you in a wonderful message last week. You hear it in our YouTube, you will be blessed, about Dambi. So this is a picture of Pastor Israel who went back and at on arrival, he was met by his wife at the airport and there's Pastor Israel and guess who was in his arms? Dambi. Come on, let's give God a clap offering, Dambi. And those, how many of you saw the picture with Dambi in a coma and Dambi, you know, you know, really with meningo encephalitis? And who is this, Pastor Israel? While the son was so sick in a hospital in Uganda, he was here interceding for Malaysia. He's a Ugandan. His son was dying. What should he be doing here? Because he was on assignment from God. So he goes back. And God says, your assignment is over. Your son is healed. Is he rich towards God? Very rich. That's God, you see. That's God. God is no man's debtor. So Jesus says, where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why don't you read it with me as I close with this very Malaysian example. Come read this with me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As I call the musicians to come up. Two months ago, I had a privilege to minister in Penang to a group of uh, youth pastors because one of the things, uh, together with Pastor Daniel Ho and Pastor Pua Sing Tiong, one of the things now at my age is that we want to impart and share our failures, our successes, to impart the younger folks. Huh? That's why next year's theme is called Empowering the, the Generations. We want to impart young people. It thrills my heart to see young people doing this, you know. So we were there two months ago and there were 21 youth pastors from the north of Malaysia. And we stayed in a place called Lost Paradise along Batu Feringi in Penang. What is so special about this place is it's owned by a pediatrician by the name of Dr. Chiu Yu Gi. And it was several acres you know, along prime land along the coast of Penang. Around me, there were hotels and there were condominiums. But in this place, several acres of prime seafront land, Dr. Chu, who is a pediatrician, has, he can actually sell this place for, hundred, for tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of ringgit. I don't know how much it costs. Because prime property in Penang, just across seafront, you know. But what he did 
was that he has set up a lot of clinics in Penang. How many of you are from Penang here? Do you know him at all? Have you heard of him? Have you heard? Yeah. Because Hope Clinics, children's clinic all over Penang. So it's very successful. But what he did on that place that he built, and this is uh, 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 not, not Hope Clinic, actually is uh, part of the, 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 the center called Lost Paradise and this Hope Clinic. In that several acres, he has built a hospital for the poor. Poor children, sick children, because he loves kids, ma. So he built a hospital for the poor. And not only that, in that few acres of prime land, he has also got a school for the mentally challenged children, autistic children, Down syndrome. So he has got special teachers to teach them. And, I, and I, when I was there, I saw the school being, being, being in operation. And not only that, there was also a, a church there that he, he was he's also pastoring there. And there's a hostel for rebellious boys. Why? A special hostel that takes in school dropouts. Why? Because he tells me that he was one of them. That he came from a very poor family and his grandparents despised him and his parents. So much so that when he visited his grandparents, he cannot enter by the front door. No? He goes by the back door. Poor man. And because he was so rejected that he began to be very rebellious. He said, I was so rebellious in school. He said, how many of you have actually burned down an entire school I have? He actually burned down the school. So he was caned and expelled from school. No hope. Ma. Nobody believed in him. Rejected by society and family until one missionary in Penang saw him, took him in, nurtured him, mentored him, cared for him, took him through secondary school and he did well. Well enough to enter NUS Singapore Medical School where he was top of the class. He became a pediatrician. And he says, Pastor, I give my life back to God. I give my life back to That's him. That's him. Humble man. Rich. But more important, not consumed by riches. Just consumed with a love for God. And what struck me was you enter into lost paradise, you see this stone. They're so well decorated. As you enter into lost paradise, I don't know whether you can even read, because it's a pediatrician, you see. So he used children's colors. Huh? You know what is written there? Jim Elliot's statement. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And if you enter into lost paradise, this thing misses you first. And he lived his life to prove it. Stranger, let me close with this. Next door, just next door to lost paradise is another very esteemed property Penangai is called it the White House of Penang. Or the Haunted House of Penang. It's abandoned. It used to belong to one of the richest men in Penang. Don't want to mention his name. Whose life was tragic. His family was fragmented and, and fractured. His son committed suicide. His grandson committed suicide. And it was told in the latter part of his life, this man walks from his house to have coffee in a coffee shop that is still there in Penang, sit in the same table which is still there. He died, a lonely man, stranger, side by side. You tell me. Who is the rich one? You tell me. Live well for God, friend. Live for God. 
Let me close now with just putting it in the positive. Give glory to God. Thank Him. Thank Him for good things. Thank Him. Would you thank Him? Give, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Thank the Lord, Church. Thank Him. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because His name Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord. back the glory as you look back in your past it's because of the grace and the love of God that you're here today friend you could be elsewhere you could have been lost but because of the covenantal love of God that never fails you are where you are today thank him give him honor give him praise give Him the glory and ask God to give you spiritual discernment to see so that you're not bogged down so that you're not distracted and every day as you begin to see what God wants you to see there is an eternal perspective and you live life differently you see very differently And be rich to us, God. Be rich to us, God. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Actually, that wasn't my closing song. What to do? I just want you to sing this song as we close. The song that many few of us have, many times have not sung it for too long. But I love this song. As the deer pants after the water brook. Shall we do that? Let's sing this song. Shall we do that? Let's sing it as we close. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Hallelujah, Lord. God that God has given me two wonderful boys 
they love the Lord. Many of you know Christopher, but many of you don't know my eldest son called Jonathan. He's in New York now. God has blessed him. He writes regularly for Fortune 500 in the main. And very few Malaysians or Asians able to write. A lot of Americans, they write very well. For a Malaysian to write, like Times Magazine or Fortune 500, he's a thinker, you see, so I'm blessed. In one of his godly moments, he spoke to me before he left for New York. He says, Dad, you know something? He said, what son? He pointed to me this passage in Luke 12. He says, son, Dad, you know something? He said, if you look at man's perspective, it actually is like that. We store. And after storing, we look at what we store and we think that we have enough. But it's never enough. Why? Because it's not enough. So we store more. It's sufficiency. And then we gain satisfaction from that. The man's perspective is storage, sufficiency, satisfaction. But actually he says, uh, God's mother, the other way around. So he explains, son, he said this. He said, our satisfaction must first come from God. When we are satisfied with God and contented with all that He blessed us with, He says, we are sufficient. And when we are satisfied and we are sufficient, then we store up things in heaven. True, you know. True, you know. Be satisfied. Contented. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Just sufficiency is of the Lord. And you live for God. Touche. He was right. Let's sing the second verse. Sing the third verse, a beautiful, beautiful stanza.
work is worship. Worship is work. Same word, avoda. Same word. Work is worship. Worship is work. So go and live every day honoring God. Not only acknowledging His presence, but giving thanks. Give Him honor. Give Him all the glory. He has blessed you. Bless Him back. Live life with a spiritual lens. See things differently. Be rich towards God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And God says all these things will be added to you. Just spend a moment of quietness before I close. God is here. He's speaking to many of you here today. Use whatever God has given to you, all the five T's. Honor Him. Love Him. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, where your treasure is, true riches, there your heart will be also. So Father, we thank you this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father God, for reminding us gently, lovingly, how we live our lives and we want to do that till you call us home. We want to spend every moment of our days loving you, Lord, honoring you. And I know that as we begin to do that, you will never, never, never shortchange us. We will be blessed. So God, separate us now with your blessing. Bring us back safely home, especially this Christmas season. Wow, what a wonderful season it is. May we use it to bring our non-Christian friends and relatives to know you. And what a wonderful Christmas present that will be to them. So thank you, Father. Separate us now with your blessing. Then go back home and bless your families. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face always to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face and His countenance towards you always and grant you shalom, shalom. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Now God's people say aloud, Amen. Let's give God a good clap offering. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. We are blessed because you came. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.